Kia ora, brother. Kia ora. Uh, yes, please. Yes, you do. Um, man, who are you talking to, bro? I'm not sure. Um, who's that guy? <laughs> um, inga hui fa uti motu uh, tena koto ko roping tuku ingwa ko manchua roa ko han aku iwi um, ko critical takumahi tena koto katua. Um, so kia ora koto. Um, when I was growing up, my 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 father were pretty poor. Like they were they were sort of poor immigrants. And one of the things you do is that um. If your kid don't lick that last piece of rice off that plate, you get a hiding. <laughs> so man, Asians, man, like we like superstars of zero waste. Um, in 2017, um, I was fortunate enough to go through a program called Leadership New Zealand. And at the end of the program, we had this um, really amazing uh, matua matua Sir, uh, Sir Justice Joe Williams. And he told me this really beautiful story that over the years really sort of guided me and, and um, I was a complete mess that night. I was trying to hide my tears and hide my snotty nose and stuff. Um, and I thought I, what I'd do is um, i split my talk into two parts. Um, Paulie said, i got seven hours, so lock the doors <laughs> and let's, let's get on with it. Um, and I hope it will do the same for you as it would for me. So it's a story about one of the ancestors of Aotearoa. I've got notes. I don't want to mess this up. Uh, Kupe, who decided to migrate south with, I'm damn sure, the consent of his wife, um, Kura Marutini. Um, there had been some problems in Hawariki and their homeland, and it was time to leave. And Kupe and Maru, Kura Maratini knew that there was an island or there was land out south. They knew it was because every year in September, this beautiful bird, um, this beautiful bird called the Pipifarauroa, um, would come and it would leave for six months at a time and it would come back. And they knew that they were, it had to find land because it, it didn't have webbed feet. And so basically um, in October, in about a month's time, Kupe along with his wife um, left on a double haul waka with 25 of their whanau. Um, and the science that they deployed to make that unbelievable journey of 3,000 miles was perhaps the cutting edge best science that anywhere on the planet at the time. Well, they did the exact opposite of what Captain James Cook did, where Captain James Cook would um, abstract himself from the environment. He would draw a picture with the hopes of charting his way towards that place Kupe buried himself in the environment to know the paths of the albatrosses and how far they will fly from land, to know how the swells of breezes, to know which cloud formations indicated that there was, there, there was land or there wasn't. And about a month later, all 25 of them were out there in the middle of the ocean. Kupe was probably asleep um, because as a navigator, he would be up all night charting the stars. Um, and Kupe's wife uttered these once famous words, he ao, he ao, he ao te roa. A cloud, a cloud, the long white cloud. Now again, the science of these people was such that they understood that conviction would draw thick clouds and that the darker the underside of the cloud, the more verdant the land. The story says, he ao, he ao, he ao te roa, but I reckon what they said, Kura Maratini said was, um, holy shit! <laughs> Kupe, get your ass up! because it was the biggest conviction cloud that any Polynesian had ever seen. And so it was, they made the greatest journey of our species. According to the great anthropologist, Jared Diamond, Kupe's descendants became Maori, and they were so comfortable here that they forgot how to get back. And it's what happened five or 600 years later that I actually want to talk to you about. A modern day Hawaiian in the 1970s called Nainoa Thompson decided that he wants to re relearn Kupe's skill. He, so he found this tiny Micronesian man with bad English called Mo to explain to him just how it was that his ancestors navigated the entire Pacific with no instruments. Mo taught him for two years, and at the end of their time together, Nainua formed a crew that he built up, and they were going to make the journey from Hawaii to the island of Tahiti Nui. And Nainua was going to be Kupe, he was going to be the navigator. And, Kupe, um, and so Mo, at the end of that two years, took him to the island of Oahu. So, to a place overlooking the horizon, and he asked Nainua, Nainua, recite to me um, the star chart from here to Tahiti. So Nainua does it. And Mo said, do it again. And Nainua did it again. And Mo said, do it again. And Nainua at this point started to get a bit worried. And he did it again for four times that day. And at the end, Mo said to him, now can you see the island? Nainua said that he knew this was going to be a pivot point for him. 
whether his answer was going to determine whether or not his two years would happen or if it was all going to turn to shit and he had to pack up his bag and leave. So he said he kind of freaked out. He lost courage and told Mo, I don't understand what you're asking of me. So Mo walked away. The next day, back again, same place, same deal. It was like Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. It's actually how he described it, basically. Three days into it, and I know he still hasn't figured out what this old fellow was on about, but he knew this was important. The fourth day, they got through the fourth or fifth recitation of the star chart. Each round would take 20 minutes. Um, and I know I said he closed his eyes, and he imagined the island of Tahiti Nui in his head. And he finally took down to what the old fellow was on about. And he said, yes, Mo, yes, I can see the island now. And Mo said to him, you must keep that island in your mind. There will be heavy seas, there will be dark storms, there will be days that, well, there will be no wind at all, and your crew will become restless, worried and anxious. If you keep that island in, your, in mind, in those times, you will be safe. But if you lose it, and because you're the navigator, you will die, and your crew will die with you. And I knew I said that this experience wasn't about navigation, it was about leadership. And that you had to know where you want to take your waka. And if you don't know that, if you mistaken, if we mistaken our jobs in negotiating the squall, which also known as the wind, the violent burst of wind in front of you, squall by squall, you will die. You must know your vision, having a vision in your head, being confident about it, and back that up with hard work and courage. And so you'd be pleased to know that both Nainua both arrived, and Kupe both arrived at the destination. They were pleased, but they weren't surprised. Um, do you guys want to know what I do in my business, or should I end it here? Yeah. Okay, another, another seven hours, excellent. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about um, my island, what I, what I try and see when I close my eyes, and fuck, it's hard, eh? Um, so, so, X as critical, our kopapa or our mission is to end plastic pollution. Beginning with the 335,000 tonnes that New Zealand generates every single year, which is insane. Um, for over 100 years, we have relied on um, extracting fossil fuels to injection mould cheap and plentiful plastics. And we've become so good at this that by 2050, all of the plastics will outweigh all of the ocean's fish. Um, Recycling, what it does right now, turns plastic waste, chips it up, and, and then we sell that as a cheap commodity. But the problem is that the technology that we use to manufacture it is built for virgin plastics. And when China stopped buying our waste in 2018, we also lost our single biggest buyer. And so the industry in itself, it's in a place where it's in need of a revolution. What we do know is that by 2035, millennials will form 85%, will control 85% of the global economy. So we demand sustainable products. Allbirds, the sustainable shoe company, reached a billion evaluation in less than two years. It's insane. Um, and the next generation, my tamariki, my kids, like you guys, um, makes me sweat even more. It's insane what you guys will, what you guys will want commercially. You don't know it yet, but shit. <laughs> Hands down. Um, sustainability will form the next trillion dollar industry. In the States right now, I think they estimate it to be about 150 billion at the moment. So it's massive and there's huge commercial incentive. So at Critical, we believe that there are enough plastic waste to eliminate all of our need to make more out of oil. We believe that we need to create a new economy for premium circular recycled plastic goods. And some of the biggest brands that we are working with right now believe in it too. We've, over the last three years, we've developed a new piece of technology that are able to transform all the kind of plastic um, waste into Beautiful materials, as precious as marble. I mean, look at this. Doesn't it take your breath away? It's fucking sexy, eh? <laughs> um, through a process of custom tech molds and recipes and formulas that mix it at all, um, we have found a way to turn a, a low-value commodity into a premium product, into a premium good. And we are working to try and create that new demand, a new circular economy for plastic waste, through our critical marble product, which is a panel that we sell to the building industry akin to precious stones that you can use for your bench top or you can use for just about anything, interior and almost exterior wise. And also through a 100% buyback program with corporates where they send us their plastic waste, we design it and turn it into a profitable product that they can then sell um, and we can recycle over and over and over again. 
For example, 50,000 plastic bags, we turned um, that into retail fixtures for Torpedo 7's new market store. Um, 9,500 plastic bottles and bags and bits and pieces of waste turned into a new countertop for Kokako. Now they can tell a different sustainable brand story. Um, yeah, so if you head down the Commercial Bay, that's what it looks like. Um, I mean, how might we eliminate our need for single-use polystyrene is the question that we're asking long-term with seafood brands like Sanford's. And I mean, we're exploring right now ways of making a reusable crate out of ocean fishing nets. And if it's broken, well, you clean it. If it's, I mean, broken, you fix it. If it's dirty, you clean it. And if it's broken beyond repair, we'll send it back to us and we'll make it over and over and over again. I mean, imagine our seafood arrive in Japan in boxes that look like greenstone. Like, what does that say about New Zealand ink? And when Prince Charles came around a couple of years ago, um, just for a bit of fun, we turned it into Tuki and presented it to him as a gift. Um, and yeah, similar thing in Fonterra. How do we take um, industrial agricultural plastics and turn into useful dairy products that farmers can use themselves? It's a tough market to crack, eh? Because all those farmers are real practical. And they're like, no, 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 we want to we go by price. Um, anyway, a bit of a rant, but there's this thing called the diffusion of innovation, which means that we want the early adopter segment, and maybe the farmers are not, we're not quite ready there until we have this technology. So anyway, next thing. Um, and of Ally Pickford's, it's about turning, so in the freight logis logistics industry, they create about a shipping container full of bubble wrap every single week. And a regular product that they use is um, flatbed dolly trolleys that they use to move furniture. And so we created like the world's first flatbed dolly trolley out of their bubble wrap mixed plastics, and we sold it back to them and they use that in their operations to close the loop. Yeah, so, um, so there's sort of, we discovered over time that there are three value propositions that businesses come to us for. One is that we can accept just almost all plastic types. Um, our products are beautiful, and they, they, so when you use recycled materials, it uses 88% less energy compared to virgin materials. You don't have to mine the material out of oil and refine it and then take it forward. Um, and, the, and the other thing is that like, we help corporates align to what their customers want by telling a better brand story. And yeah, as what the brother said over there, um, we're working on building the, the first factory um, right now. So yeah, I mean, this stuff, um, it's interesting for investors, but in terms of our business model, basically, like when corporates send us their waste, um, that volume, whether if it's eight or 20 tons, become now forever recyclable. So we help corporates become kaitiaki or, or achieve kaitiaki tanga over their own plastics. Um, but it's a great business model for us too because we can actually reuse that 20 tons into new products and just sell it back to them again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we started Critical with the intention of building an enduring company that care, um, yeah, that care for people and the planet. When I close my eyes, I see Critical becoming a billion dollar global brand because the challenge of plastic waste is requires just that much, that much resource. Um, what I also see is that um, we will use, well I see that Critical will be building compelling and beautiful products um, that will be there to regenerate the planet um, and towards kaitiaki tanga. And I also see that we're using our profits to manaki those who need a second chance through meaningful work. Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, katoa. Kia ora.